You're watching Rich History, Priceless Future, the Tarpon of Boca Grande Pass. Former United States Congressman and Moat Trustee Andy Ireland is a resident of Boca Grande who understands the importance of research and education in protecting the Charlotte Harbor and Boca Grande Pass fishery. It doesn't take uh, many years to see the changes. I take the last 15 or so years that I've actually headquartered uh, half of every year on Boca Grande. The change in the fisheries, of course, the, the, the redfish was threatened there for a while. The, the snook had been threatened. Clearly, uh, all the famous pictures you see on the wall in so many of the places in, in Boca Grande of, of the tarpon back in the, in the late 1800s. And it's, it's, a, it's a different thing now. There, there are fewer of them. Uh, uh, the size is not the same. And it's, uh, in a sense, uh, always been, but it certainly is now the time to recognize what that is and, and uh, perhaps make some changes. Increased recreational pressure on the fishery in Charlotte Harbor and Boca Grande Pass has become a topic of spirited debate, with some citing the sheer number of anglers fishing a relatively small area every season, and modern advances in tackle and electronics as possible causes for the collapse in Port Aransas. However, Evidence is now showing that fishing pressure is only one of the pressures on this fishery and is likely only part of a larger, perfect storm that could be brewing. One that includes elements like habitat loss and destruction, pollution, and other environmental changes. We're finding out that there were habitats that were destroyed when we didn't even know they were there. I think the mangrove thing is important. People come and say, you know, I'd like to clear out these mangroves because it makes my view better. And you can't just say, oh, no, we, we don't want you to do that. You've got to say, no, we don't want you to do this. But how about listening to why? There, here is the why. And uh, people deserve to know that. And people want to help. And not everybody is a, that ever knocked down a mangrove is a bad person. They probably didn't know, you know. And the depth of... Uh, that kind of thing is quite substantial. I think a really great example is there's a, a nearby on the estuary a, a, an area that was about to have a high rise built on it uh, here two or three years ago. And for reasons having nothing to do with fisheries or anything else, the, the, the people in the area said, wait, you know, we've got enough high rises for right now. To, and then it wasn't, didn't go through. And not, not long after that, they uh, discovered in this last several years, uh, a few years after, that this is an important uh, hatchery for the baby tarpon, which they didn't, no one knew where they went. Had that uh, high rise gone up there, the baby tarpon would have been gone. Think for a minute, uh, how many hatcheries are already gone that we didn't know were there? That shows why the research is so important and why the education so people know is important. And of course, it takes the people living in the estuary uh, along with the, the research of a fine organization like Moat to make things happen. As part of the Moat Boca Grande Partnership, groundbreaking new shark research initiatives will take place in Charlotte Harbor and Boca Grande Pass. They'll be headed by Dr. Bob Uter, Associate Vice President for Research and director of the Center for Shark Research at Moat Marine Laboratory. Well, what we're focusing on is the dynamic that exists between tarpon and sharks and people, because people are now part of the equation in Boca Grande Pass with, with the fishing activity that goes on there. We're looking at the interplay between, between the, the prey and, and the predator, in this case, the tarpon and the sharks. And we have questions to answer, such as, do the same sharks come back to the pass every year? Have they learned uh, to be there at a certain time when fishing is going on, when, when hook tarpon are an easy, easy prey? Um, these are the kinds of things that have been questions people have been asking for decades. And we are now proud to be down there and starting to, to tackle these questions. We've been working there as a, as a lab for almost 60 years, and we've got all this data to build on. What's exciting now 
is that in the last 10 or 15 years, we have new technologies to, to bring to bear. Things like electronic tagging systems where we can follow the movements of individual animals. So we're going to be applying that in this initiative and looking at the results and comparing it to what we knew about populations of sharks, tarpon, and, and other resources there. Um, and we'll be able to draw conclusions pre pretty readily about about the status of, of sharks, uh, the interplay between sharks and tarpon, uh, pretty quickly because we have this great, this great uh, foundation of information to build on. Clearly, Boca Grande Pass is a major place for tarpon to come to feed uh, in great numbers, in, in the thousands, inside this very narrow uh, body of water. And also, uh, it appears that they go to spawn offshore from, from Boca Grande Pass. So they're spawning somewhere in, the, in perhaps the evenings, coming back to the pass to feed uh, during the day. So the cycles of that are, are yet to be worked out, and that's part of our work. Um, but of course, this is a very unusual situation, this, this density of these animals. And they're coming from great distances to, to come there to feed. This is all part of the mystery, and it's part of the reason why we're down there to, to study uh, this area as a kind of a, a living laboratory, a very special place. What we learn in Charlotte Harbor is transferable to other systems to understand the, the status of, of other places. Um, Florida as a state has been a leader in the conservation of, of a lot of our sport fish, including sharks. Uh, sharks became essentially a sport fish in the state in the early 90s. So um, we have a very healthy population, relatively speaking. And what we see in Charlotte Harbor then is comparable, or we can compare it to other systems and then grade those other systems. For example, uh, when we look at contaminant levels in Charlotte Harbor and look at the level of these contaminants inside of, of fishes like sharks, we see that it's, it's pretty low compared with, with other places like Tampa Bay or um, Apalachicola Bay, for example. So, this research is important not just for the Charlotte Harbor Boca Grande area. It's important for the state and, and for the nation. It's really an, an important scientific initiative that we're talking about. Coming up next. Education was key in putting it into our mission statement for the tournament. Well, fishing tournaments are, are really public events. And so it's become more important with so many more people watching to send the right message. It's too big to lose It's in our hands We need to keep it as it is If not better than we found it Water, water Everywhere but we know we gotta Move fast or it might disappear The ocean lives Barely breathe 